Thank you very much for inviting, and I will start my talk, so bear with me, please. Uh, it's, uh, uh, <clears throat> this conference, as uh, you have uh, seen and you have heard from these in introductory notes, it's about um, religious memories and also the ways religion is implied in the national, cultural, collective memories. And it's hard to avoid uh, uh, the reference that Susanne already made to Hervé Léger, to Daniel Hervé Léger, because that's the basic thing that comes to mind uh, immediately when talking about this uh, topic. Uh, oops. Yeah. Yes, religion as a chain of memory. And its very function is to keep the past working in the present, to keep it and con constantly reproduce a sense of continuity, and in a way to resist the time. Or as Jan Asman, who, who was also mentioned uh, uh, today, earlier, as Jan Asman wrote, to produce the non-modernity and to be, in a way, a counter present. Some religious people would be offended with these kind of statements, for they would assume that their religion is deeply embedded in, uh, uh, in the present. And this may be also true, of course. Yet religion is sociologically, indeed, a force of continuity and tradition. To be sure, it can blow up the present, by the, but the purpose would be, again, bringing it back to the ideal, sacral past, reenact the past. Religion possesses professional skills and professional means and media, most sig significantly the language, of course, to make sense of the past, to make the past meaningful, to sanctify it, or more precisely, to create a sacred map of the past. A map that is meaningful to the present because it is energized by the sacred meanings. Let's put it in, more cautious, in, in, in a more cautious way, though. At least, should we say, religion is expected by many in our societies to be in charge of the past. Uh, there are at least two ways religion can produce and maintain the sacred map of the past. Uh, one is the cult of the dead, the most archaic and fundamental form of religion, with all its various ideas of overcoming death, uh, and most importantly, its complex material and sensual system of commemorative rituals. The second way used in religions to create the sacred map of the past is making moral, moral discourse, the moral judgments about the past relevant to the present. And in the program of this conference, we are going to have lots of uh, discussions, lots of uh, case studies uh, on both commemorative practices and the um, moral rhetoric by religious actors. Now, I should elaborate on what I said. I was using this abstract term, religion, but what religion is, uh, what, what, we, what do we mean by, by, by religion when we are talking about all these functions? Uh, and uh, uh, something that here, here comes a major distinction, first of all, between the official religious institutions and what, we, uh, what can be called uh, uh, the vernacular discourses and practices. And we are going to have a special panel tomor tomorrow, uh, as I remember, on the vernacular practice, uh, practices. Uh, so the two streams that are more often in contradiction than in symphony. Now, the, this was this, uh, uh, the, the, the first precision. The second precision, the se uh, uh, second fundamental thing 
is that today religion, in whatever form, is, is not, uh, uh, can by no means claim the monopoly on the work of collective memory and pretend to have any exclusivity on the commemorative practices and moral judgments. This is clear. In the secularized world, the main uh, counterpart in creating the sacred map of the past is national and ethnic collective memories and the groups and actors who represent them or claim to represent them. They can exist in various forms as well, either be institutionalized through the power of the nation states and national laws, sometimes created through international rhetoric and uh, international pacts, and sometimes produced by vernacular civil agencies and communities. So boy, both religion, religious and secular fields of memory work are therefore multiple and plural. The memory landscape is full of controversies, contestations, rivalries, and competition. This is because we know, since Maurice Halbwasch, that collective memory cannot be other than plural, because collective memories are linked to affective communities, and because affective communities need a hot memory, as Asman called it. Memory which is created by the present and for the present, and therefore reflects the plurality of rivalries of today. As a Russian author, Maria Stepanova wrote, we have a tendency, all of us, we have a tendency to see the past as a huge world for colonization. The colonization of the past by ourselves. So um, the most rich and productive field for our research, in my view, is perhaps this deep interaction between religious and secular memory work. Most contemporary cases of collective memory belong to one of the two types, I guess. Either a kind of a sync syncretism or mixture or dynamic interaction of religion and secular elements. And uh, in this program, we are going uh, to have uh, some case studies of, on, on this matter of the, uh, showing this kind of interaction, the World War, II, uh, World War I cele celebration. Uh, memory uh, in Russia or Armenian genocide, but we are not going to, to have the Armenian genocide, uh, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, that's right. It was cancelled. And Lit Lithuanian national, national saints or Crimean Tatar deportations, Srebrenica, etc. In all these cases, we can see some kind of combination, sometimes quite organic and sometimes not very comfortable between religious and secular discourses and practices. And the second type of collective memory is direct competition, direct competition in situ, on place on, uh, between these two types. And uh, both types will be addressed uh, at the panels today and tomorrow. In any case, the religious, uh, religion is somehow present, either directly or, so to speak, in a transformative way. Because as I said before, the very language, the very language of con continuity, the language of the long durée, uh, of the sacralized past, was borrowed by the secular agents from religion. And the semiotic of basis, uh, basic ritual performances of sacralization was borrowed by the state and by other secular agents from the religious repertoire. And uh, there will be a special panel on this tomorrow, by the way. Speaking specifically of today, where we are now, we can add yet another important reflection. A certain activation of religious agency, the post-secular discourses that, that was mentioned by, uh, by Yulia uh, 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 earlier. So uh, the activation of religious agency, religious discourses, religious rhetoric, uh, it's the result of kind of rise of the powerful rise of conservative sensibilities, conservative and reconstruction projects in various parts of the world. Today's fashion is the past, not the future. Memory, not dreams. 
uh, if the intuition of scholar, scholars such as Aleida Asman and Pierre Nora are correct, and modernity's future-oriented temporal regimes slowed down, and modern memory studies became more in demand than futurology, and we witness, we witness uh, l'avènement mondial de la mémoire, as uh, Pierre, Pierre Norato uh, said this, the kind of glo global rise of memory, then, in this case, religion claims its rights and mobilizes its skills in recreating and maintaining the chain. And even the secular states tend to cooperate with religions rather than uh, uh, compete with them. Uh, excuse me, may I have a uh, glass of water, please? Thank you. Now, thank you very much. Now, the memory of the 20th century has its own powerful specific. In a very clear way, the 20th century is squeezed between the two great narratives. To use a catchy opposition by Bernhard Griesen, the narrative of triumph and the narrative of trauma. Today's collective memories are still defined by this opposition which is at the very core, I would say, of, the, of modernity's uh, ambitions and fa failures. But these narratives usually come together. Now the triumph, the heroic of the century, promoted by the nation states to support the national pride, or by the optimistic scientists and humanists, are inseparable from memorizing the trauma of massive human losses and anthropogenic disasters of the past century. For us, it's hard to give away with this perception of the 20th century as a full of catastrophic violence. It might be an aberration. It might be an aberration uh, in objective terms, given the progress of sciences, the overall uh, increased softness of relationship, I would say. But when we see the history in terms of collective memory based upon the lived history, which still affects us, even though it's now a post-memory after the two, three generations, or a borrowed memory, uh, to, use, uh, to use another term from uh, Halbwash, uh, the borrowed memory, the memory which was not experienced uh, directly. Uh, even in those cases, when we look back at the 20th century, we rather, uh, rather see the drama than the development softness. We rather see xenophobia uh, than the tolerance, persecutions than the ri rising uh, or increasing freedom, mass atrocities rather than mass celebrations. Maybe we tend to dramatize this, dramatize the past, and this makes the memory of violence stronger than any kind of, uh, other kind of memory. Or is it typical to intellectuals to, to whom we proud, proudly list ourselves to think in this way? Um, I don't know. But this dark side of history seems obvious when we speak of the region that Timothy Snyder called the bloodlands. Eastern and Central Europe. <coughs> but in fact, there were no less atrocities in other parts of the world. We, we need to remember this as well. Uh, take Southeast Asia, China, Middle East, Africa. They come to mind as well. Uh, speaking about the uh, 20th century violence. And here we see another strong connection with religion. Thinking about mass violence necessarily implies, implies some kind of religious reflection. <clears throat> First of all, <clears throat> because some particular acts of violence were religiously motivated, uh, either openly or implicitly, 
there were religious aspects in many cases uh, throughout the 20th century until the 1990s, the Yugoslavian wars, for example, and many other cases. Also, because some mass violence was in the opposite, motivated with anti-religious, godless intolerance. But even beyond these concrete historical connections, the mass violence implies religious references and religious reflection, simply because religions own special relationship with ultimate issues that powerfully emerge amidst the rampant violations of justice, dehumanization, and dying. Mass atrocities and biopolitical engineering created a huge semantic hole, uh, <clears throat> a semantic hole that uh, in rational explanation of history. And this leads to a quest for a different kind of knowledge or different kind of explanation, justification, and indeed reconciliation with the past. And here we have the classic Halbwasch's opposition of schematic cold history and effective, uh, and effective warm collective memory when the first proves to be unable to grasp the history, uh, the, uh, the uh, historiography as such, rational historiography, so to speak, uh, uh, proves to be unable to grasp the sense of the past, the second helps providing the sense with non-rational means effective means, many kinds of it indeed. Uh, it may be deep metaphys metaphysical doubt, paradox, irony, apocalyptic fears, stubborn faith, and, and other things. So it helps to restore the process of meaning building, uh, which was broken. As I said, today's memory of past triumphs doesn't look radiant or happy. Triumphs are very often connected to the trauma and victimhood. And the trauma and victimhood of the 20th century are indeed uh, uh, very complex, very complex phenomena. It might be one of the three types, to my view. First of all, it's the trauma of innocent, uh, innocent suf suffering of complete dehumanization, of downgrading to the level of, uh, of the vita nuda, bare life in Giorgio Agamben's terms. Second is the trauma of, of the guilt. Um, the trauma of the guilt of, uh, uh, of the murderers uh, or a collective guilt of being somehow related to murderers through family ancestry, or, shape, or shared nationality. And the third is the trauma of the hero, as the uh, uh, same uh, Bertrand Griesen puts it. Uh, a certain price for the triumph, certain sacrifice. Sometimes the work of memory seems to be crystal clear. The innocent victims of the Holocaust or other genocide is more or less a clear example. In other cases, though, the memory becomes very convoluted, very intricate, something what Alexander Atkins, in relation to the memory of the Soviet political terror, called warped memory. In Russian, it was, uh, in Russian, it was translated as krivoya gore, krivoya gore, a crude grief. I don't know whether uh, it's a good translation into English, but that's... Um, no. Krivoya uh, Gori in Russian. In such cases, there is no clear boundary between victims and perpetrators, victims and heroes, innocence and guilt, an impossible tangle of moral judgments, aggravated by the imperfection of the laws, the ambiguous politics, sometimes politics of silencing or semi silencing, and which is, by the way, the case of today's Russia. In the case of Germany, the grief and trauma were also crooked. And the Vergangenheit's Bewältigung, the coming to terms with the past, could only partly proceed in purely legal terms and a deep, purifying repentance 
was required. In all, ha uh, in, in all that uh, I have just said, you could hear some keywords from religious thesaurus. Sacrifice, suffering, innocence, guilt, mourning, repentance, and many other terms. To be sure, this, these words are mixed up with secular words and concepts, as I said, uh, by, but they seem inevitable, uh, however secular our age is. For example, the word guilt is a legal term, of course, uh, but within a moral uh, discussion, and moral deliberation, it produces a connotations with sin. So another reason why religion is involved in memory work is simply the amount of mass violence of the 20th century, which created such a total and prolonged grand situation uh, when the ultimate issues of life and death inevitably require some types of religious action, reflection, and religious language. In the final analysis, the mass violence raised a few major issues in which religions claimed their expertise, but they were hard issues for the re religions themselves, for the churches themselves, for the believers. Uh, one issue is, one such huge and very hard issue was uh, human nature, mostly good or deeply damaged, virtues, virtues or, sin, or sinful. The second issue is the nature of uh, the nature of the world order as such, the, uh, the issue of providence and uh, final redemption, a classic question of goodness and om omnipotence of God himself, the classic question of theodicy. And, but the sheer dimension of the 20th century catastrophes puts a much more radical question for believers and religions and churches. Is God really there? Or was he really about around when all this happened. The classic form of this doubt was the Nietzschean uh, death of God prediction and its continuation in some post-Auschwitz uh, theologies, like in, uh, specifically in Richard Rubinstein's, but in others as well. Others would start with revolt and anger against God, like in Elie Wiesel. Within European Christianities, including Central and Eastern Europe, the trauma was manifold. For some, the sense of complicity in the Holocaust. For others, the sense of being left behind and let down by God in the communist persecutions. For others, still, the doubts in an overall validity of God's benevolent providence. These doubts and even anger were coupled by the massive secularization in Eastern Europe as well as in the West as a kind of objective process. These developments altogether drew limits on religion's participation in the work of memory and questioned the validity of purely religious forms of commemoration. The study of the memory work we are engaged with, we are engaged with at this conference is exploring finally the complex interaction between uh, the multiple agents of the uh, agendas of the multiple agent, uh, agents and uh, actors. Look at how the memorial narrative of the Holocaust has been contested with collective memories of Central and Eastern Europe. I was following the Lithuanian case uh, recently. I've read this uh, Ruth uh, Vanagaitis a book on uh, Muziskai, how do you say in Lithuanian? Uh, hours, hours. It's, uh, it's a, well, it was very controversial, but it's, it was kind of a powerful book uh, about the role of the Lithuanians and the local people in uh, killing the Jews during the uh, Holocaust in Lithuania. According to Vanagaita, the Catholic Church and uh, had also an ambitious role. The prelates would not openly accuse the genocide, while there are documented cases when some particular priests made such accusations and helped the Jews. 
Uh, we know many similar evidences in Latvia as well. I uh, spent uh, every summer in a country house in Latgalia, and uh, this year I, I met in Daugavpils a person who is the, the, the biggest expert in, in the Holocaust in, in, in Latvia. So he told me very many, many similar stories as well. In the Baltic states and other parts of Eastern Europe, the collective memory is really crooked, in, uh, warped, in the sense that I used it, Atkin used it, because the uh, nations were squeezed between the two totalitarian monsters, between Hitler and Stalin. And so the anti-Soviet heroes, the partisans, were collaborating with the Nazis as the anti-fascists collaborated with the NKVD and thus complicit in the, either the Holocaust or the Soviet terror. These confusions can be used to remove complete, completely remove any responsibility and both the societies and the churches have a hard time to resist this trend. Religion is deeply involved in shaping the national memory and, uh, and, uh, uh, and national guilt, and the memory of guilt. One example is the story of the cross, crosses of Auschwitz, uh, described by Genevieve Zubrisky, who will join us tomorrow. Even beyond the issue of the Holocaust, the dominant religions are strongly present in the collective memories. It seems that Catholicism, powerful narrative of Polish history, continues to shape the national memory discourse in Poland in many ways. And this is also true in a different configuration, say, for Romanian Orthodoxy or for, for other uh, churches as well. The Ukrainian collective memory, as you know, uh, is, um, and, and, and the religious memory, as uh, uh, Yulia uh, Osusana mentioned earlier today, is dramatically torn, unsettled, plural, and is in fact under construction right now when the issue of orthodox autocephaly is uh, so passionately discussed. And you know this last news yesterday is the, 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 the break of the relationship between the Russian Orthodox Church and the uh, 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 Patriarchate of Constantinople. So uh, that's about Ukraine. And for religious minorities, of course, religion is central in their collective memories. And this is true for the Uniates, for example, the Greek Catholic churches in Hungary, Romania, Slovakia, Ukraine, and other places, and for the Muslims, and for the Protestant communities persecuted in the Soviet Union. Now, my, my last part is on Russia itself, the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, my major field of research and one of the most complicated convoluted of, the, of this convoluted religious memory. There will be a few papers at this conference on, on Russia, so I'm not going to go into detail, but just to summarize some and to share with you some ideas. Russia is an obvious example of this memory dilemma between the narrative of triumph and the narrative of trauma. First of all, there is a strong tendency to present the Russian Orthodox tradition as a millennial chain of continuity from Vladimir Sviatoslavovich to Vladimir Vladimirovich. This was clear in Patriarch Kirill's speeches and recent documentary, if you uh, could see this, the Valam, uh, the documentary that shows that where Putin himself directly connects the triumph and traumas of the Russian state with the flourishing and the destruction of, uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the Russian church. So revolution, the uh, Russian revolution is thus recognized as tragedy and catastrophe. But at the same time, this model of continuity uh, of state, state church con continuity uh, uh, and, uh, makes, uh, makes it difficult, makes difficult the sober assessment of the entire 20th, 20th century. Sen secondly, connected to this, 
There is a certain perception of the Soviet past in both political and religious discourses. We know that the victory over Nazism in the World War II is certainly the foundation of Russia's current civil religion. <laughs> victory is uh, a foundation of official patriotism, uh, the memory of imperial might, a cult of the strong state, strong nation. Victory is also a, a sacrificial experience of global re relevance. It is interpreted in terms of redemption of all the sufferings and guilts of the Stalinist terror. So the evil of the Gulag, of Holodomor, of Katyn, of mass ethnic deportations, etc., are all somehow redeemed through the victory over a greater evil of Nazism. The blood of the heroes purifies all national sins. This mechanism of redemption of collective sins and guilt extends even to the history of religious persecutions that was a part of the terror, totalitarian terror. The Russian Orthodox memory of the Soviet Union is again very complicated in this sense. <coughs> Excuse me. The sufferings of the dominant church were no less terrible than that of the minorities. It was a tragic experience of survival. But that, was, that included persecutions, resistance, adaptation, collaboration, and on the top of this, again, secularization as an objective trend. Today's church inherited the big compromise of 1927, when the church declared their loyalty to the Bolshevik regime. And this loyalty was never addressed, even amid the waves of most cruel, cruel, uh, cruel persecutions. In the late Soviet times, the church hierarchy was tightly connected to the regime and cooperated with it. The memory of this collaboration and docility is very much at odds with the hagiography of the new martyrs, which we will discuss at this conference. At the same time, now the church, uh, in the context of close ideological partnership with the ruling state, ruling regime, is trying to avoid direct confrontation with the state and uses a political memory agenda of the state based on the narratives of triumph, sacrifice, for humanity, national continuity, and perennial, eternal, conservative values. But in the non-official, so-called popular theologies, I came across other explanations as well, from most primitive conspiracy theories to more sophisticated ones, referring to God's kind of divine uh, uh, conspiracy, in a way. Uh, God's providential plan of purification through suffering, the revolution being a sort of flagellum day, the scourge of God. Uh, in this providential way, the purified Holy Rus has been paradoxically conserved within the Soviet shell from the corruption of liberal modernity. Uh, the image of a world's guardian of conservative morality is thus found on both official and vernacular levels. But again, as collective memories are always plural, we must remember there are different groups and different communities within the church itself. Opposed to the dominance of national and official narratives, there are always hidden transcripts hidden transcripts, to use uh, the term uh, of James Scott, or cultural intimacy, to use the expression of Michael Hertzfeld. I think this, the central task of the entire field of memory studies is exploring this kind of hidden transcripts and cultural intimacies uh, behind, the, behind the official narratives at all levels, from folklore 
to the personal ego documents, art, literary works, and so, and so on. So within Russian Orthodoxy, we can find various publics, various milieus with different sensibilities, different frames of memory. But outside the religious milieus, outside religion, uh, there are the Russian civil activists, such as the people from the Memorial Society, Memorial. They are not quite cooperative with the official church in the work of memory. They look at the national trauma outside the frame of the redemptive victories or millennial continuity. They are trying to return the names of all innocent victims, not just those who can be qualified as orthodox saints. And this is the meaning of a secular, secular uh, ritual, commemorative ritual within the last decade called the return of the name Vozvrashenia Imyon on October 29th in the downtown Moscow at the Lubyanka Square, right the opposite to the KGB, now FSB uh, main building, near a Solovki stone, uh, an important new nematop uh, or lieu de mémoire. Now the ritual is performed in many cities and beyond Russia as well. Since 20, as, as far as I know, since 2015, it takes place here in Warsaw, Warsaw as well, on Zamkova Square uh, on the 29th of October, very soon. This ritual is, of course, a political statement. The Stalinist state is accused as such. And so the narrative of continuity would also affect the present political regime. However, the meta task and significance behind the memory work is reviving the names and reviving the particular faces. Uh, faces and particular persons. By the way, face and person have the same root in the Russian language, litso and lichnost. Uh, in Russia, this ritual, uh, this ritual, the return of the names that I'm referring to, is a kind of a counter transcript, or counter transcript, or counter discourse, if you want, opposed to both the official national narrative and creating a quasi religious narrative different from the official religious narrative. So, uh, Um, overall, in my view, the return of the names has an extremely deep religious connotation as well. According to some religious theologies, the name is the person. And so remembering the names persons is a kind of a form of collaboration with God in his work toward last judgment and resurrection. So there may be this kind of inter interpretation as well. And uh, should I, I have, I, I wanted just to show a, um, just a few seconds of this one. Just to show you how it works, this, okay. Впоследствии Маша, моя мамаша права качала по этим конторам, была сослана на поселение. Вот. 
и его впоследствии, когда он был изуродован и вышибли, глаз ослеп, он вернулся на поселение. Вместе они прожили на поселении, после войны вернулись в Москву и прожили долгие годы. Вечная память Жано Мартыновича Буевида и Кашину Алексею Константиновичу. Он был директором металлического завода оборонного. This is how, uh, how it works, this uh, ritual of co commemorative uh, rituals at the uh, Lubyanka Square in Moscow. Konstantin Vasilyevich Drozhinin, 48 years, Bugalter Moskovskoy Central Base, Mos Vayantov. Everybody uh, refers to two names uh, of some Pavel private persons who were uh, repressed uh, during the uh, big term. Расстрелян 10 марта 1938 года. Мой прапрадед Скворцов Дмитрий Никонорович раскулачен в 30-м году, выслан за пределы Рыбинского края and, через and, город and he, с зубом. She refers to her grand grandfather who was also. So everybody can add uh, a relative or ancestor of 6 августа 1937 года ночью был арестован, и 21 сентября на Рождество в Городице 1937 года расстрелян на Левашовской пустоши. Вечная память всем погибшим, всем убитым, и свободу Юрию Алексеевичу Дмитриеву. So basically that's... That's all. Yeah, we can. Uh, 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 if you if you want, you can go to this. Uh, uh, this is the um, record of the last year's commemorative uh, ritual at the Lebanka Square. So, Dixie, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for thank you very much for this talk. It was it was really amazing, and I think uh, you really were able to show uh, how much this secular and religious are interwined, and also how much of uh, how much the religious memories are uh, multi-layered. That you know we have this official and the vernacular, and it is not uh, one monolithic memory, but uh, there are very different. And also, I, I very thank you for this last presentation and the pictures from Moscow, because they really show how this ritual can be also called as a post-secular, how much these religious uh, traditions they, and roots and some values, they live their new life in the secular uh, rituals, which are very important for the secular uh, societies. And because they have these roots, it is really important that we better understand the, 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 the relationships between uh, religious and secular languages and how much this religion, what does it really mean? But I don't want also, uh, of course, to dominate the discussion, even if I have thousands of questions. So now this is time for you. We have 15 minutes and, well, Please, I will. We will collect questions, maybe, yeah, and you uh, and uh, Professor will answer on them. Professor Lim, yeah. Um, thank you very much for your talk. My question might be too broad. I mean, I'd like to ask about the gender aspect in religion and memory. So, in Eastern Europe. And then when the religion contributed to the formation of memory or memory regime, how was the role of gender? I mean, I think just my guess is that this religious memory of the past is very closely uh, knitted with a sort of masculine memory, masculinized memory, something like that. So if you point out some points, I would be grateful. Yeah. Shall I go? Yeah, thank you very much. That's, uh, uh, of course, an important part of the whole story. And uh, uh, I believe that when uh, I, I, I was talking about this kind of multiple agendas of multiple actors, I would include also the gender differences as well. And uh, this is on the studies. And that, that's an interesting idea that the, the official narratives are masculine and, uh, and some official, uh, some counter narratives as well. But uh, when I was 
uh, mentioning the, uh, uh, this, uh, the, the, the hidden transcripts, so to speak. That uh, absolutely the field where the, the gender and the women, the female uh, responses and, and reactions and memories are dominating, I guess. That, that, that's, that's probably, uh, well, I, I would say that uh, women had a better memory uh, in general than, than men do. <laughs> so, but not, not necessarily this. The, the most important is, of course, that the, these are hidden transcripts that are uh, uh, extremely important in, in terms of the gender, um, gender differences. Thank you. And thank you for pointing this out. That, that's important. Thank you. My name is Vera Herold. I'm come, I come from Lisbon. Um, and I'm working on a private memory project about the Germans living in Lisbon um, during the 1930s and 40s. And uh, I was struck by the hidden transcripts um, expression because uh, I've been working, of course, a lot on that and on the tension between private memories versus public, uh, public memory discourses. And so I use, uh, I've been using the expression of alternative archives because I, I worked with uh, Derrida's uh, archive fever. I, I work in culture studies. Um, and these are, of course, of women and children. And uh, to bring these memories in uh, the child during the 1930s and the 1940s and the women, the women who didn't write, but uh, who told about their memories or you can find their memories in, in object. And that complicates and convolutes this mono, very monolithic um, public memory discourse. And they will have to coexist somehow because this multi-directional and multi-layered memory, how, how, how can they coexist? Uh, well, it's, that's a huge question, of course. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, that's, uh, I, I, I don't think that I, I, can, I can add some, some substantial to what I already said, but that's, thank you very much for pointing out to another aspect of the, whole, of, of, the memory of the memory studies, the children's, the children's memories as well. So that's something important because um, I, I remember that uh, there are some, I, I saw in, uh, in an archive, in, uh, actually in the Memorial Society's archives, uh, uh, children's uh, uh, paintings and uh, well kind of spontaneous reaction to what they saw and that's, that's a fantastic source never explored so far so that's um, something that comes to mind that if uh, uh, somebody has time and uh, uh, could, uh, could do uh, research of this one so that's thank you very much Sonia? Okay, okay, so, okay, so we, 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 we can. Um, what I would like to know, what is the attitude of the Memorial <coughs> Society uh, to the church and the discourse of the church? Because I know that often they are partners, like <coughs> in the opening of uh, monuments and so on. Sure. But what is yeah. their attitude? So as I said, actually, the, uh, 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 the main prog problem is, of course, uh, if, if we are talking about the official church, of course, official church, church leadership, the official narrative of the church. It's, as I said, it's very different because of this continuity kind of idea and uh, uh, because of this symphony kind of uh, ambitions of the, of the uh, church le leadership, the symphony with the state, which is not exactly uh, w willing to uh, explore in details the past uh, the, uh, the, the Soviet past and the persecutions. And so, in this sense, uh, the, the rift between them is very, very important. So, that's create big problems in communicating between them. Although, at some particular places, some particular nematops, so to speak, some particular uh, mm, uh, uh, <laughs> events, they do cooperate at, at some level. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, mm, 
but, but, but they don't coincide in some many, many, many important uh, you know, principles. And, uh, and of course, for the memorial society, the main thing, the main uh, blame and the main guilt is on the state on the state. That's what uh, the founder and director, late director of the Memorial Society was always repeating, Arseniy Raginsky. Uh, he was repeating that the state, we, we need to say that the state was complicit, the state, the regime itself, and everything that is connected to the state, uh, uh, which is not at all the main emphasis in the uh, uh, official church narrative. So I would say that here the rift is very important. And of course, the second one is not, it is, just goes beyond the memory uh, uh, problem as such, uh, because memorial is also a uh, human, right, human rights society that is working uh, on, on contemporary violations of human rights, uh, which is not exactly the church's concern. So in this sense, they are not also have some problems in cooperating. Okay. Uh, Alexander Yatsak, Polish Institute of Advanced Studies. You mentioned very important thing, uh, the split between Russian Orthodox Church and uh, uh, the Patriarchy of uh, Constantinople. Uh, and you told uh, a lot about the past. And what do you think about the future <laughs> in, this, in this regard? Yeah, I, I think that what happened yesterday was the, a part of this chain of uh, uh, events, and it, it comes to the very, very strong uh, break uh, within the um, ortho Eastern Orthodoxy, um, and uh, the, uh, uh, the reasons are, uh, first of all, the ambitions of two men, as I believe, and second, the political uh, developments, and of course the the, the most important thing is that Ukraine is now building its national identity, a kind of a late, uh, 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 they, they are late comers to, in, in a way for, to, to this, because all the nations, all the uh, Eastern European nations say, uh, they got this uh, national identity and national uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, independence in a way, in this, in this way, many, many years ago, like 100 years ago, right? when, or, or, or even more, when the idea of autocephaly was really important to, uh, <clears throat> to pin, to, uh, to, to fix the identity. Now, in, 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 uh, in the 21st century, it sounds like uh, a little bit strange, the state church, the the, the, the big national church, the one autocephalus. So that's, that's kind of strange, but for the Ukrainians, because they are going through this road of building the national identity is really the important questions. But uh, <clears throat> sorry, I can't say right now nothing uh, <clears throat> about the, f the future. Uh, uh, I, I only uh, will we'll, we'll, we'll be waiting what happens to the uh, Ukrainian church which is under Moscow Patriarchate, because I do know that there are many uh, <clears throat> people and many uh, bishops and many believers there who would definitely go to, the, uh, to this new church. So they, that's, they will be split within the split. That's the first uh, things that come to mind, and I, I believe it will be this way. Thank you. Uh, Magdalena Lubańska, Institute of Ethnology and Cultural Anthropology in Warsaw. Uh, thank you for this amazing lecture. And my question is about, uh, because you write and you've mentioned uh, post-secularity, and uh, my question is what uh, epistemological values uh, this category gives us in the studying of religious memory? Uh, what else we can see and w w what opportunities uh, this concept gives us? Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I, I'm not, uh, uh, well, a, a big fan of this term. Uh, but I would say that uh, it's useful in, uh, as a kind of a frame, as a kind of a frame. I don't, I don't believe that the term itself can really directly help us in, 
uh, in our research, but as a frame uh, s signaling that something has happened, something has changed. Uh, that was, I, I, I was actually, I mentioned this, the, the rise of conservative discourses worldwide, the rise of the uh, national uh, kind of uh, make America great again or make, make Russia great again, make Poland great again, or these kind of discourses, you know? That's all, all are uh, related to this rise of conservative values. And with this, religion becomes uh, more relevant in a way and participates in, uh, in a stronger way in, in the work of memory. So that's the frame that gives us uh, the... Uh, general frame that gives us this idea to, uh, uh, to, to, to somehow generalize, but uh, not directly using the post-secular uh, post, uh, 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 discourse or term in, in, in the particular uh, uh, empirical studies. Thank you. Do we have some more questions? Okay, so so maybe I could uh, I could ask about the, the the problem which was. You raised. have a million. You have a million of questions. We, yeah, I have million of questions here, but I would like to return to 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 the question of Professor Lim and our colleague from Spain. Sorry, I haven't remembered your name about this uh, gender memory. Mm -hmm. So my reflection is that here. Uh, through this, so for instance, if we look on the Christianity, eh, Christian religion, you can find in the Christian religion many roots of the female religions, pre-modern mm -hmm. religions, which are like what I want to say that even in, in not even but in Christianity, you may find a lot of place for women and for for for, for this 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 rituals, and this is what the Halbwachs described in in his. Um, Les Evangelions or Terzond. He, he shows that the, the power of religion and of this memory is that it includes many things. Of course, they, they mutate, they change, but they are still present. And so, so this is also that, you know, we can't oppose because God is a man. We imagine that he's a man, but, but, but there is a place for everybody. And to, to your question, you know, because if I understood you correctly, I had the impression, but what about children? But religion is like this is the, the, the big, it is for everybody. And children are also included. There is also, well, I'm not talking only that there is the place in certain religion for children, and children can p find place in different religions well, as, the, as, as the role. But the children also ask questions about the future. Yeah, mommy, what has happened to daddy? It is completely another question that I think you, you wanted to ask. Yeah, what has happened to Jews during the Holocaust? It is like abstract for us living today. But what has happened to daddy who visited us for many years and now he doesn't come? So I've, I would like to ask you about this that you know, uh, because we, we try to oppose and I think that in, in, in this question what I heard was rather from this official level, yeah? So there is some, some, some but, but religion is lived religion. So we really think through it and it uh, composed uh, the life the, it, it gives the sense of life and it helps some people to live and it, it, you know it, it, it touches many spheres of your life yeah it, so so what would you uh, what you could you could you could you what do you, <laughs> yeah, I, do you I, yeah I, I think I have no time to elaborate on this and but but I agree completely that's uh, 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 this, this distinction that I mentioned in the beginning the official official and vernacular narratives, but we are going to have these panels on this. And uh, within the vernacular narratives, the predominances, uh, mm, uh, uh, I would say that the, the, the hidden transcripts of, of, of we, we, women, female, as I said. So that's, that's certainly the case. And also, I would add uh, another consideration, just empirical and uh, historical uh, mm, uh, consideration of, of the fact that uh, women were uh, the faith keepers, actually, throughout the, let's say, the Soviet, the Soviet past. So, all, uh, the the when when the priests who were men, were, uh, were uh, were killed, and 
uh, when God as a man or the man was killed as well. So these were women who kept the memory of, uh, of the rituals, uh, of the ideas, of the, of the uh, practices and things like that. So that's, that's another thing that uh, um, should be added, of course. Thank you. Mm -hmm.